let us open our time of study while you're finding 2 Corinthians 4 in your Bible with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonderful gift of this day and this time. Thank you for the opportunity to declare your word. Thank you for the uh, witness and the message and the work of all the uh, saints who have gone before us. Lord, all those who have sought to forward the cause of your gospel, to make clear your word, to understand and do your will. We praise you and thank you for all these things and this opportunity to stand in that great living tradition which you won for us in making us a part of your church, your body, your bride. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, one of the great uh, books called uh, th that I've read called Preaching Christ, and I really highly recommend if you're interested in such a topic, includes a, a fun anecdote that's probably only a few lines long. But it uh, talks about a, a young minister, young pastor who comes to a congregation and, uh, you know, small congregation. He's get, getting up there and teaching and giving his sermons. And there's a little old lady who sits down front, your typical quiet uh, elderly woman. And every time that she saw him getting off point, she would holler out, lift him up, raise him up, lift Jesus up in the middle of his sermon. Now, that behavior would be a little odd in our con culture, but even more odd in that congregation's culture. And while the behavior might have been a little bit unusual. It shows a singular dedication and commitment to what is truly important, and that is lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ, both in our uh, church sessions, our sermons, in our lives, in our teaching, in our preaching, our talking, however it is that we are involved. And that's exactly what I think Paul is getting at in this important passage in, uh, in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians 4. And we're looking at 1 through 6 today. So um, we'll look at it in three sections, as we often do, verses 1 and 2, focusing on the ministry which Paul had been given and which uh, we could argue we share in by extension, not the apostolic ministry, but the ministry of the church. The gospel opportunity that he had in verses 3 and 4. And finally, Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus the Lord as the focus, the true center of all the ministry. So with that, we'll open up with verses 1 and 2, which read, therefore... Oh, Wait, sorry, I've got this one on the screen. Aren't these beautiful, by the way? Now you can see, I hope. And if you can, please read along with me. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Excellent. So we open up with this phrase, since we have this ministry, and thankfully, my happy accident had us reading exactly what that ministry's about. Now, this ministry word's going to become important because he's actually going to use two uh, seemingly related words in concept, but they're very important in their distinction. Here he used the word diaconia, which means deacon, or, or word which we would translate sometimes as deacon, but what it really means is servant. So every time you have a deacon board or a deacon group, they are meant to be servants of the church, serving the specifically the physical needs of a church body. And so this idea of ministry is always tied up with, or should always be tied up with, the principle or the concept of service. And we miss that at times, don't we? We think of people who are in ministry as leaders more than servants. I think it was Charles Ryrie that said, of all the books and all the, the, the uh, teaching on servant leadership, it seems they spend all their time talking about leadership and much less time talking about the service. And yet, that's precisely what this is. When Paul used or penned these words, he would not have had the, the concept of ministry in our modern you know, idiom that we might think of. In fact, he just thought of this as serving others, like a waiter ser serves tables, someone who makes uh, other people's lives uh, better by, by sacrificing for them and doing what they uh, need and what they need to giving them what they need to receive. And the service here is the gospel ministry. The service is making clear Jesus Christ and what he's done with the unveiled face, being able to see clearly all the meaning and power of the Old Testament as it points immovably and unmissably to Jesus Christ and his ministry, his life, his coming to earth, his death on the cross for our sin, and his redemption of us, the people of God. This is a wonderful blessing and gift. And 
as a part of this, he notes that they too have received mercy. We don't need to rehearse all of the uh, events of Paul's life, but we can very briefly note that he had spent his early years in faithful dedication and devotion to the Jewish way of life. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He excelled in his schools and was a great uh, uh, up-and-coming hero of that movement. And yet, when Jesus Christ miraculously appeared to him, all that faded away. Those whom he sought to persecute and destroy, he was one to. With those most powerful words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Oh, the power of those words. Paul thought he was persecuting and attacking an errant group of Jewish uh, believers. But in fact so identified our believers with the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul found out that he was not attacking some random group of heretics, but was actually attacking the God of the universe directly, and he took that personally. That changed Paul, and he realized that his hubris and his hatefulness and his rejection of the truth really deserved nothing but death, but God extended to him mercy, sparing someone the due consequences that they have earned. And because of this mercy, this continuing mercy, this continuing action of God, he says he does not lose heart. And in the next passage, we're going to look at some of the pains and difficulties and trials that Paul pointed out, but we want to note how the passion pushes through. This is vitally important, and we see it in the life of Paul. We might wonder, was he just one of those guys, one of those people who drives and drives and doesn't know when to quit? Or was he motivated by something which is meant to motivate us all? You see, your Christian mission, your Christian service is vitally important. People hearing the gospel and being saved from an eternity in hell is important. It's more important than the day-to-day tasks of your life. It's more important than the humdrum, I've got to get my IRA or my taxes filed. By the way, pay your taxes by all means. But, But recognize where the priority is. Living the Christian life is important. It's not just some therapy to get through or get by. It's not just a better way to experience life, though it is that. It is critically important that you, as a representative, as an ambassador of Jesus Christ, are on your A-game. And how do you get on your A-game? By doing nothing but trusting and keeping your eyes fixed on the Lord. It's His working in you, not your uh, sweat of your own brow. And so... I hope that you understand that when you wake up tomorrow morning and you head into your day, that you need to be rightly aligned to the Lord Jesus Christ. The consequences are eternal. It's the difference between a life rewardable and a life unrewardable. It is the difference between glorifying God with your day and your life and this moment. You never know when that opportunity will come up, when you're going to say, make that statement that finally really breaks through or gets through to your children, to your spouse, or encourages them in the Lord. The thing that you might quickly forget might be the most important or one of the most important spiritual memories in their life because your eyes were fixed on Christ that day. Do you realize that Christianity is by no means a spectator sport? Sure, we've built it up to to center around and circle around with the people that we think stand above the rest, folks that we think are great or excellent. Maybe they're great speakers or great students. Perhaps they're even excellent and bold evangelists so they can argue for Christ. But The reality is, is that what Jesus Christ is doing on earth, he is doing through you and your life, in your neighborhood, in your household. It's not about what the the quote-unquote best and brightest of Christian celebrities are doing. It's about what the Lord is doing in you in your family, in your neighborhood, in your workplace. It's about the prayers that you lay before the Lord each morning, impassioned, begging for His involvement and interaction with your life. It is about learning moment by moment to rely upon Him and keep Him as the center and the focus of your gaze. 
So the question comes, are you going to be discouraged by the opposition? Because there will be opposition. The Lord is not the only force at work in this world. We know that Satan and all of his powers are working to try to obscure the gospel, to try to silence people from sharing it, from try, to try to silence us from talking about our faith and the hope and the life that we've been given. Are you going to be discouraged by fear? The world does a good job of trying to bully and beat us down, trying to silence the truth. Oh, sure, they're fine to hear about God in general, but to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life is the most offensive message. To recognize that your good works, your hard works are meaningless in the sight of the righteousness of God, and you need the righteousness of Christ is offensive and will make people uh, even violent against us. But that didn't stop Paul, and it's not meant to stop us. Will despair stop you? The growing realization that you have very little control in this world except over the things that you think and say and do. And even those won't have the desired impact all the time. Will that discourage you or lead you to despair? Or will you just get distracted with all the fun things to do in this life, all the ways in which we can entertain ourselves and make ourselves feel good in the moment and get through. Sure, we'll come to church if it feels good. Sure, I'll read the Bible if that feels like something I need right now. Or will we be constantly comforted and encouraged by the mercy which God has shown us in His Son, Jesus Christ? It is a right an effective balm against the discouragement and pain of this world. It is the answer to help us understand what that good news and that good message which we have to share in every situation. There is not one person on earth that does not need the mercy and the love of God as expressed through Jesus Christ. And if we accept the world's uh, perspective on this as if we're spreading some kind of disease or virus that will only slow us down. Because we are not spreading a virus, we're spreading the cure. As we looked at recently, while our message might be and have the smell of death to those who are perishing, it truly is the smell of life, peace, salvation, and freedom to everyone else. So might I encourage you, if you are struggling to be motivated, to talk about the Lord, to share the Lord. Turn your gaze to the great and wonderful mercy of Christ. Draw it back into perspective. Remember your own salvation. Let that motivate you because the same love which transforms your life through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, can transform any other life as well. Be bold and share it. Like Paul, might we have that passion motivated by his grace that pushes through the pain, the hardship, and the fear that comes through this life. He moves on to talk about what he's renounced. Now, this is important because Paul is defending, again, his ministry to these Corinthian believers. And the first thing that he says he's renounced is the hidden things of shame. Now, it's very likely that your mind immediately, when you think of the hidden things of shame, you're going to tend to think about hidden sin or hidden sins. Um, and while certainly I'm sure Paul did renounce those, I don't think that's what's in perspective here. I think what's in perspective here is the mystery religions of his day. And the mystery religions of his day with which Christianity was easily confused were, a, in, in a sense, these closed group clubs that propounded to have mystical or mysterious knowledge. And you would get inducted into this club, usually by paying money and making some kind of investment, and then they would teach you tiers of hidden knowledge. And the idea is that behind the final curtain, once you'd paid your way up through these tiers of, of this mystery religion, is that you could gain salvation. And Paul is drawing a sharp distinction between biblical Christianity and the mystery religions 
that multiply the systems of human control. You see, you hold in your lap, as you're meant to, all of the revelation. I don't have access to anything that you don't have, and neither does anyone else. We all have the Word of God. We all have the Spirit of God, and it is not some sort of mysterious, mystical shell game to keep you from the next level or from advancing to the next level. Even offices in the church, such as deacon and elder, are not meant to be in any way secretive, but rather are positions of overt service. And the elders and the deacons in the church exist to serve and grow and see the church spiritually grow as they're meant to. These mystery religions, as well as various uh, people from the Jewish background, uh, started by a guy named Philo before the New Testament era, began mystically or allegorically interpreting the word, twisting and deceitful in that, uh, that thing, which we'll, we'll circle back around to in a moment. But this idea of mystical or allegorical interpretation, which we're all possibly vulnerable to taking, the book of the Bible is large and even difficult to understand. There's plenty of, of history and background that we just don't know, and it takes time to learn and piece it all together. That's why we teach through the Torah. That's why we teach through the whole picture of the Bible, because we want you to be equipped to learn that well. And yet, there is always going to be a, a, a group of the population who seek to take the word and say, well, mystically or magically, I know what it means. I know, and you don't. So you have to come to me to find out what the Word of God means. And nothing could be further from God's uh, vision or ideal. And that's exactly what Paul's saying, is that he's not using these mystical, I know something you know, don't know, it has been magically given to me. He's pointing out that they are teaching the Word clearly. Why would he mention this now? Because he's just used an Old Testament example. And he did not twist it. He did not reinterpret it from some magical, mystical, or spiritual perspective. He rather explained what it meant and what the shortcomings of the ministry of Moses were and how they had been better fulfilled in the current ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in the church of God. He was pointing out, we're not like them that go back and reinterpret and change and twist these scriptures for our purpose. Quite to the contrary, we are here to see exactly what the Old Testament literally said and how it looks forward to and compares to this different ministry in the church today. But he goes further and says they do not, or they've renounced, they have repudiated, they're not going to walk in craftiness, right? And this is noted by deceitful or deceptive behaviors. Well, Paul had been given a tremendous ministry in the church, a remarkable ministry of apostolic leadership, a place of authority and also a venue for the Word of God to come forth. He recognized that he stands in the same level ground that every believer does. And so, not deceiving in terms of uh, financial deception or manipulation, and this is so frequently, quite frankly, what people get into ministry for. Ministry, politics, the desire to manipulate others, the desire to stand before others and control their behavior, because for a certain type of person, that sounds fun or safe or powerful or something in some way attractive. And Paul says, no, they weren't about that. They weren't trying to manipulate people to do what they wanted. They were, in fact, trying to make clear God's will so that individual people could live a life that glorifies God. And finally, he, he highlights this point again, right, in kind of a, almost a chiastic sandwich structure, going back to that they were not handling God's word deceitfully. They chose not to uh, twist Scripture. It's very easy, and I've mentioned here theological interpretation. Theological interpretation is defined or can be defined as when you take what you already believe and use that to deal with a passage that challenges your perspective right? And we want to avoid that at all costs. It's going to be difficult because, again, we're learning this huge uh, revelation from God about His character, about His plan, about His church, about Israel, about all the things that He's revealed about His nature and what He's going to do. And it's easy to get a, an idea in our head and then reinterpret everything in light of that idea. This is exactly what happens with all of the major systems of 
of interpretation, whether that's Arminianism, open theism, Calvinism, or some of these isms that you'll hear, they all take one perspective from God's word and say, everything else is going to be subjugated to that idea, whether it's God's justice or God's sovereignty, and they try to make that the top thing and then reinterpret every other thing that seems to conflict with that. And it causes us to twist Scripture. Forgivable? Certainly. We're all on a process. But hopefully we're moving towards hearing clearly and simply the Word of God and not seeking to twist it to see what we want to see. That is why we're so passionate at this church about this simple method of Bible study. We observe, we interpret, we apply. We look at the text, we make observations from language, history, and culture, and we can all agree and say, is that true? Yeah, that's true. Or no, actually, I found this information over here. And we can correct and, and get a clear picture of what that meant to its original author, to its original audience. And then once we've got all those facts and, and ideas from language, history, and culture, we can then interpret that and say, okay, reasonably, what does that mean? And once we've understood what that means, the singular meaning of the text, we can then apply the text to our life. Well, there's one interpretation. There are multiple applications. And so as we come to study about the sovereignty of God, it'll have applications while we're doing the dishes in the morning and have applications as we look at our, the political landscape or the world landscape. It'll have multiple uh, different applications. And why do we point this out? Because this is the only way that you're going to let God speak for himself. Very simply, if you're using some sort of mystical method to find out what it means, then you're not letting God speak for himself. You're inserting your idea of what it means, or I'm inserting my idea of what it means, and are impacting what God truly wanted to communicate. So while this does take work, there's no question. We are separated from the, the biblical authors by thousands of years, by uh, different languages, radically different languages, by cultural differences that we are just now beginning to understand after 2,000 years since that time initially passed. But it's the only way that we're going to hear what the voice of God has to say and be able to truly say, thy will be done, not mine. That's why we take this seriously. That's why we teach like we do. Some will come in and say, oh, it feels so academic. And it's because you don't need another happy, sappy message to make your fee-fees go better for 15 minutes. You need the power of the Word of God. You need to transform and be transformed, as we saw last week, from glory to glory as you look and hear what he has to say. When it challenges us, when it confuses us, when it makes us wonder if we've misunderstood maybe everything about life. And boy, I tell you, there could be someone here today or someone listening today who really has been convicted that they have been saved because they're a better person or that they're safe in terms of their spiritual destiny because they worked harder than everybody else. And I got to tell you, the word of God has a simple message. You're going to hell. You're not headed to heaven on the basis of your good works. And there will be no scales on which you get to put yourself on one side and jack the ripper on the other and assume you've won. It is by the grace of Jesus Christ alone that you can be saved. That is it. That is all. No works can win it. No works can confirm it. It is absolutely the work of Jesus Christ by faith alone through grace alone. If you need that message, I hope you hear it today. And so similarly, as we look at the Word of God, and we should expect it to challenge our thinking just as we saw last week, as we look at the, the Lord Jesus Christ unveiled through this wonderful and perfect revelation of his character and his plan, we have that opportunity to say, I'm not right, and you are not right. God's word is right, and that's what we value. That's what we care about. And where we're wrong, we seek to be re reformed in that wrong perspective. And so we look at the word line by line, verse by verse, passage by passage, and book by book, because it doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what great uh, popular Christian on TV thinks. It matters what the Word of God has to say, period, and end of sentence. And that's what Paul is claiming for himself. 
saying that he's not uh, refor- or making up a message on his own, but revealing what the Lord has already said in the Old Testament and what the Lord was in the middle of revealing to him or had revealed to him. With this ultimate goal that they would reveal the truth, revealing the truth of the word of God. As we've said, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the truth of the biblical worldview. We don't talk about that probably as often as we should, but let's go through each of the three of these. The enemy always wants to attack the clear gospel of grace because it's so easy, just as he said originally, or just as Satan said originally, has God indeed said. This grace gospel is too good to be true. We must surely add works to the beginning, the middle, or the end. We must surely add water baptism, or we must surely add first communion, some kind of religious ritual. We must surely give a certain amount of money or somehow prove what the Lord has done. But that simple and pure gospel glorifies God and God alone and never us. And so we'll see that the the gospel, the message of the gospel is constantly under attack. The person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ is the next thing that's under attack. The world would reduce him to a good teacher or even a fantasy or a fairy tale that never existed at all, though few serious historians would make such an asinine accusation. The New Age uh, movement would reduce him to being a spiritual leader or a spiritual force like any other, Buddha or Muhammad or any, not recognizing that their messages are so uh, diametrically opposed that one could not be true and the other's false. And every major cult in church history has centered around the idea of either removing Christ's humanity for he was 100% human, or his divinity, and reduce him to a simple human. That's every major cult, either taking away his humanity or taking away his deity, taking away his ability to save us. And finally, that picture of the biblical worldview is under constant assault. As we live in an increasingly secular society, we're in a slightly different flavor than was Paul and the early church that were in a largely pagan society. So their world that had many gods and goddesses with no objective sense or standard of of morality or righteousness, it was just kind of pick your favorite flavor, Well, now we live in a world where everybody views themselves as God and as the ultimate arbiter of truth and their ultimate standard. And so in our secular world, we find ourselves at exactly the same level of opposition with what the world believes, preaches, and puts forth, but in a very different way. And it's important that we continually represent the biblical worldview, the reality of object, the objective standard of God and his character, the reality that there is a judge and all will stand before him and be condemned apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ. The truth of this biblical worldview that God is in control and it's not just a meaningless bumping together of various atoms and particles and molecules but it is designed with a purpose to bring glory to God that he has chosen to redeem us and make us once again useful, though we were rebellious against him. This idea that everything has purpose, meaning, and focus towards the designs of his creator is something that you cannot fail to represent in the world. We wonder why this world is filled with depression, sorrow, sadness, and despair. What else is there in their godless, empty, hopeless world? Their bodies, their souls are designed to reject all of the disgusting lies that they've accepted, but they insist and insist and insist because they don't want to be responsible or recognize that they're responsible to their creator. So they deny and they silence and they shut down, even within their own soul, that abiding and undefeatable knowledge that they're created in the image of God, that there's a moral standard that they've failed to meet, and that there's a judge that they will ultimately have to face. 
That biblical worldview, praise God, is difficult for the world now to see. But we have two huge advantages. One is that it is encoded into every single human being. Whether they're willing to recognize it or not, they know that it is true. And no matter how uh, slick their thinking or their reasoning or their escape tactic is, they are always fighting that reality that they know deep down to be true. And the second is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is constantly doing His work to convict and draw every unbeliever to Himself. They can resist, reject, run away, but if you're representing the truth of the Word of God, the grace of His gospel, you've got two major advantages in that task. I'm not saying that that means that everyone will be a success. Far to the contrary, there will be most people who are at least resistant, if not outright reject, as you're sharing it with them. And praise the Lord, as we saw in 1 Corinthians, there is a part for everybody in this. One sows seed, the other waters, and someone else will harvest. But everyone has a part in that process. Whether that's sharing nice things or spiritual things on social media at the risk of uh, gaining some sort of heat from other people in your life or trolls on the internet. Or maybe plucking up some real courage and talking to the people who are really important to you about spiritual things. This is the ministry that Paul had. And so they say they're not, uh, sorry, in this sense, they commend themselves. Now, their commendation of themselves to human conscience. We want to note that their, their commendation is not to human fame or human power, but they are re, re, uh, defending, rather, they're defending their message. The message of the truth of the Word of God and the revelation of God through Jesus Christ. They're defending the message of the salvation that's come through Christ alone. They're defending the reality that they are God's instrument, Paul specifically in this instance, of God's revelation. So they're not commending themselves in terms of trying to uh, maintain some level of authority, fame, power, or finance. They're commending to them their ministry of the Word of God had to be a difficult time, didn't it? I mean, it's one thing now to look down the annals of history and recognize that God has truly given and preserved these documents through generation after generation of people who would attack, burn, and destroy it. Here it is, the most published book in the world, to look at the witness and testimony of the power of the Word of God to break down every barrier and break through every uh, satanic plan to try to silence it or remove it. It's easy to look back and go, yeah, Paul was clearly chosen by God to this task. But it would have been more difficult when, who is described as a, a short, hobbled guy with a big, bulbous nose, showed up and said, I've got a message from God for you. It might have been tough to buy, especially when there were other people, possibly better looking and more uh, uh, powerful in their presentation, that you could choose to follow. It was a challenging time, and I say it again, how blessed we are to live in this time, to see what we see and to know what we know. How much more difficult it would have been to discern the spirits in that time and in that age. Surely the Lord is faithful, but we are so wonderfully loved by God and so blessed by God to have the complete Word of God and the Spirit working in us. So they are commending, by commending themselves to their conscience, they are trying to commend the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God, just as we should. So now we look at the next two verses, if you'd please read with me. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So we see here that uh, he's talking again about that veiled gospel. It's a time where we give the customary reminder that the numbers in your Bible were added later. The chapter breaks, while very helpful, the verse breaks were very helpful. Uh, you know, again, shouldn't 
in signify that those are the units of thought. The unit of thought is the entire context of the book, the entire context of the section or the, the testament, and the entire context of the Bible. So we want to look and understand how he's using this in the context of his discussion, especially if you missed last week, brush your eyes over uh, the reading that we did. Paul points out that the gospel is only hidden to those are, who are perishing. He's pointing out and, and reinforcing his point that when you read the Old Testament, we see the plan and the actions that brought about the salvation that Jesus Christ ultimately accomplished for us. And truly, it is an amazing thing that you can read through the Old Testament and miss the anticipation of the Messiah, miss his special ministry, miss his action and his work in that. So he says and, and points out that the only people who are missing it are the people who are willfully missing it by uh, failing to believe. They're blinded, we hear, by the God of this age. This is Satan. This is the ultimate personality, a, a great and powerful fallen angel who's chosen to rebel against God. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 give us a keen insight into his mind, his I will statements. He wants to sit in the place of God. He wants to have authority over this world. And by deceiving Adam and Eve, he gained a temporary amount of control in a might-makes-right way in this world. And so Paul is absolutely right by calling him the God of this age. He is the top authority in this world, in this time, by God's allowance. Ultimately, that will come to a violent end. But we want to note, what is Satan up to? Is he moving world leaders and trying to uh, engineer great things on this planet? Absolutely. He has a large-scale plan, and he and his uh, army of fallen angels and the spiritual forces are constantly and unsleepingly and unceasingly at work trying to bring about a world in which Satan can singularly control humanity and blot out the possibility that people will know and glorify the one true God. But in terms of the part that we are going to be affected by, we see that Satan's chief work is to obscure the gospel. If he can't erase it or silence it, then he will pervert it. He wants to keep people from knowing the grace and love of God. He wants to continue to keep people believing and feeling that they're good enough on their own, that they're better than average, that they have no need of anyone else or specifically of God's mercy for they're better than others or they're good enough or they're going to come out well on the, the scale. He wants to obscure the gospel of Jesus Christ by silencing those who would preach it or by introducing and influencing those claiming to preach it, but perverting it in its fullness and power. Ultimately, Satan's desire is to keep these creatures made in the image of God from being redeemed. So while the work of of the Word of God in you as a new creature, a new creation in Christ, is assisted by the power and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the core conscience of every person. There is a tireless force seeking to silence and distract people from hearing or attending to the truth of the Word of God, the truth of the gospel, or spiritual things. They are blinded, again, he repeats just as he did last week, by their unbelief. No external force upon them. They are blinded because they have made a choice not to believe in the revelation of Jesus Christ and the power of his word. It is their unbelief that renders them incapable to see and put together all of the facts and ultimately behold him personally through faith. And if they would believe, that veil would be lifted. It's simple, right there in the text. And they would see Jesus Christ not as we might think we know him or they might think they know him, but as he truly is. See, Jesus Christ is the image of God as attested elsewhere in Scripture. Please read with me John 1, 1 through 5. 
Here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You see here, Jesus Christ, as we'll uh, see in, in, in John uh, one fourteen, is, is equated here with this word prologue. He was with God. Note, he in the beginning was the word. Not in the beginning the word was created, not in the beginning the word started, but rather Jesus Christ was already in existence when the words of Genesis are described, in the beginning God created. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God and exists in co-equality and unity with the other two members of the Trinity. And while the uh, earthly ministry of Jesus Christ started a new phase, a new uh, point, in fact, we'd say the centerpiece of all human history, Jesus Christ already was eternal and in existence just as the Father and the Spirit. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. Jesus Christ is the chief agent of creation and the chief source of life. Please read with me Colossians 1, 15 and 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Jesus Christ is the image, the picture of the invisible God. And as Pastor Dick was so fond of saying for so many years, you will never know God better than you know Jesus Christ through his word. He's the picture He's the, 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 the visible, the seeable, the interactable image of the spiritual and eternal reality of God. Again, the source of all creation. He is the one who made, for whom it was all made, through whom it was all made. He is the one who redeemed it, and he is the one who will come back to rule it. The entirety of this physical world, down to the breakfast toast you had this morning, to the green lemonade you'll have this afternoon is all to bring glory to Jesus Christ who created it all. Our final passage on this topic we'll look at is Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. Again, if it's clear, please read with me. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Here is a wonderful and remarkable message. You see, all of the people to whom Jesus initially appeared had only known God through his revelations and working with Israel, through the words of the prophets. And now, standing before them was the representation, the clear picture of God himself. And for us here today, you can introduce Someone to Jesus Christ through faith in him today, and they will know the God of the universe. Not have to wonder, not have to, to, to fits around and try to figure it out, but rather be able to behold the God of the universe and know him in salvation and joy. Maybe, maybe we need to get excited about that again today. You don't need to, to find some intermediary, but your prayers go right into the throne room of heaven because that's where you're positioned with Jesus Christ, placed in him. He intimately knows you, and you are growing in the intimate knowledge of him, growing in the grace and knowledge of him. And you can tell someone to trust in Jesus Christ today. And in, in the space of a moment, 
They will finally know the God that they've wondered about, guessed about, worried about. Finally know him personally through his love and through his work, through his full revelation in Jesus Christ. It all comes down to this reality of what it means to preach the Lord Jesus Christ with our lives. So please read these two final verses in our study today with me. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. To borrow a phrase from elsewhere in Scripture, this is one of those beautiful not-I passages. Many ministers and ministries are trying to form some kind of club, maybe a personality cult or maybe a denomination. I'm absolutely open to the criticism that even non-denominational churches take on denominational characteristics and can have the same uh, self-righteous sectarian perspective as otherwise. It's easy for us to fall into that focus because I think we're all looking for that easy out of a person to follow, someone we can hitch the responsibility of our faith to and say, I just follow that guy. He's he's the tallest, he's the slickest, he's the fastest, whatever it is. And there's other people, as we pointed out before, who thrive upon that idea of personal fame or personal recognition, perhaps money or power. But Paul makes it clear what should be all of our attitude not a desire to build up or lift up a certain ministry, church, or name, or human organization, no desire to lift up a certain theologian, writer, author, pastor, but rather seek to be invisible before all others. So that if we do have to take a place up front, it is only to minimally obscure as possible the clear vision and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done. That's where Paul's at. That's why he can say with all confidence, other than the Lord's selection of him for this role, that they should follow him because he's not seeking his own glory. He's not seeking his own fame. He's not seeking the uh, power or strength of his own movement or some revolution that he's leading. He didn't want to make Paulians. And it saddens me as much as I appreciate the moniker of Pauline theology that many people even call themselves Pauline Christians. It's, it's a contradiction in terms. You are a follower of Jesus Christ or you're a follower of someone else. So if you're willing to put a name, a title, a handle on your faith, second guess it. Are you willing to call yourself a anything-ist? Are you willing to follow anything-ism? By all means, take advantage maximally of the great men and women who've taught the Word of God and seek to learn from them. And they're wonderful teachers, and and we all stand on the shoulders of giants, of, of people who've given their lives to make the Word of God available and clear to us. By all means, I'm not saying don't learn from others. And please don't take this as some sort of ignorant, bullheaded, pietist perspective that suggests that it's just you and the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. That's bonkers. The Word of God is hard to understand, and we sit with the entire body of Christ empowered by the Holy Spirit to come to understand it better together. But by no means put someone else's name on your relationship with Jesus Christ. Let no one be before Him in your understanding and your devotion and your desire to know Him. Paul made that plain. He didn't want the focus on him. He wanted to make Jesus Christ everyone's focus. And so, not I, but Christ. They don't preach themselves as the important people. They preach the Lord Jesus Christ, his person, who he was, as we saw, fully divine and fully human. His work at the cross giving up himself so that we might be redeemed, giving up his life 
crucified in all innocence, taking on the sin of the world and saying with finality and authority, it is finished. And there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of what he has done, what he's completed, not just some fanciful spiritual voice from heaven, but God himself stepping into the world, driving a stake through the temporal reality of all human existence, of time and space, so that we can look back and say, there was a time when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped into our reality and physically paid the penalty by dying on a literal, actual cross, his bones being, uh, or sorry, his skin being broken by the nails and by the whips, his suffering being real as the sin of the world was poured out upon him. And when he said it is finished, it's because it was done. There is now no need for any sacrifice, for Jesus paid it all. And his work is clear, and that is our message, and that is our hope. But not only that, they preach the Lord Jesus Christ in his plan, in his person, in his work, and in his plan. Because the story is not over. The show's not over yet. We have this brief opportunity in time to reflect his love, to come to know and trust him and to make his love and grace known to others. We have these, this brief moment. We don't know when it will end, when the Lord will call us up to glory and be with him. This is the opportunity. This is the moment to grow in the grace and knowledge of him, to accrue and do things that are rewardable by his and from his perspective. This is our opportunity to be trained to raise with him in this next phase upcoming of his reign and rule upon this earth, wherein Jesus Christ will crash through the walls of reality and finally declare his ultimate victory over Satan and over the ungodliness of rebellious men and become King of kings and Lord of lords in actual practice. And if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, then you're part of that plan. That's your hope and that's your future and that's where you're headed. And now Paul changes the word that he's gonna, he used before. Remember, we said he used diakonos. He used the word servant. Now he says we are slaves. You might have bond servant. I think that's an a antiquated translation. It's fine or maybe was fine at a point. But the word here is doulos. It means slaves. He says that, you know, that before we, there were ministers, there were servants, but now they are bond servants. They're slaves. They're one whose will is totally sold out and subjugated to the will of God. And they have no will left in the matter. Slaves is correct for modern uh, usage. Ourselves as slaves for Jesus' sake. There's a a message that's difficult for us to fully comprehend. Once we've been saved by grace through faith, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, how long does it take us to realize that his will is best, his way is best? And you're never going to do better with this life than by responding faithfully to his word, by trusting in his perfect salvation, by trusting in that position in Christ, by trusting in all that he's given you. Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of all this world, all this story, and all of our lives. This principle of light from darkness, I believe he's again drawing back on this Old Testament picture, this Genesis to Revelation, Revelation, of all that God is and wants to do. Please read with me Genesis 1, 3 through 5. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. When God first created this world, he created it, And then he formed it. And yet the first thing that he brought forth into that chaos was light. He did not first create the sun to make light. He was its light. 
And we see that same pattern repeated when we get to John 1, 6 through 9. Again, please read with me. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, and all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. You see, something pretty amazing happens between Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1. Apparently, that God himself provides the light for the first days of creation. But as we get into the second half of that week, or the second part of that week, he provides physical lights, the stars and the moon and the, and the sun, to provide that light. And when Jesus Christ took on human flesh and came into the world, that first light, that primitive light, that light that beams forth from God so that we might have spiritual ability to see came forth and broke into our reality. And so John 1.14 explains in clearest terms. Please read with me. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word dwelt among us. When we come to study His Word, if we're doing what we're meant to be doing, we behold His glory. And when we behold His glory, we're transformed from glory to glory. So, brothers and sisters, lift Him up. Lift up Jesus. Lift up Jesus however you can think to, in whatever way you can. Is it a passing comment in a conversation? Is it inviting someone out to, to, to coffee or to dinner? Is it, is it taking that person or you're meeting in line or at the airport who probably already hates you and will never think less of you than they do now and, and risking all of that to talk to him about Jesus? Is it having the boldness to share with your loved ones and encourage them towards Christ. It is our opportunity every single day to raise Jesus up, to preach Christ in every opportunity, in every place. And I pray that we all do so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you. What a gift to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to know freedom and mercy and salvation. Lord, I pray for every soul here, every soul within hearing who knows you, that we would learn how to be motivated by your incredible mercy and grace and love. Father, no longer fearing the conflict or discomfort of the situations that might arise, but rather boldly sharing the one thing in our lives that is truly worth sharing the gospel, sharing the one person that has made all the difference and makes all the difference. Lord, may we be motivated constantly by the wonders of your grace, the, what, that which you have given entirely apart from anything that we could earn, do, or deserve entirely to your glory. Lord, please motivate us, encourage us, give us a clear vision of your Son and yourself. Might we so live in the joy and the love and the peace and the patience and the kindness of all that it is to know you. Lord, that we adorn your word and your gospel with our lives, that you are raised up and Lord, that one more might not perish until you come for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.